Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hawaii. Uh, I think we're going to cover neurofeedback today, uh, but first we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of self-care, uh, especially when working with trauma, and maybe you can apply this to your own life if you find that you are struggling with compassion fatigue or uh, any of those other issues that relate to uh, kind of the helper's ailments. <laughs> Um, first and foremost, I'd, I'd like to recommend what my original supervisor first recommended to me. And that is that if you're going to work in an area such as trauma counseling, you really should consider the model of taking a vacation every 90 days. Even if it's just a three-day vacation to go to the beach for two and a half days. Um, but you do the best that you can every 90 days. And, and the reason for that um, is essentially that you're either experiencing a vacation or you're planning for the next one. So that uh, as soon as I get back from Hawaii, you know, uh, ar arguably finances, you know, considering I'll be planning another small trip or another big trip. And um, veteran therapists who specialize in trauma typically try to get out uh, of the country or out of uh, the mainland um, about twice a year and, and have at least two other vacations where they take a week off. And you're just starting off or if you're building something, uh, you might consider doing uh, two or three three-day weekends and then focusing on maybe one big vacation a year if that's all you can afford. Uh, but the interval being essentially every 90 days is significant for the purpose of ensuring that you are thinking about the next thing. So if you come back, uh, say from an especially hard day at work, um, you do have like this kind of positive resource in your life, this, this thing that you can go to mentally, this, this kind of network in your brain that says something's coming, I can actually think about that, I can plan for that, I can put energy and resources into that. Um, and there's a lot of value in, in having that thing coming up next um, and to make it maybe a principle or priority in your life that um, you're either on a trip or you're 90 days away from one or less, giving you the opportunity to have, uh, again, what we refer to in, in some aspects of trauma counseling as uh, a cognitive resource, um, something, a network in your brain that you can shift to that's readily available. Uh, you know, there, we, we talked about pleasant places on the first day of class. It's similar to that in that um, it's something positive by which you can make dominant in your brain um, as an alternative to what you might be coming home with, giving you some choices and something to shift into. So anyways, outside of that, uh, let's, let's, uh, we can always talk more about that later in another class with questions. Uh, today I want to cover a very simple uh, you know, resource that I'm going to provide you here. It's copied into your, 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 your Moodle account. Um, you'll notice the neurofeedback uh, introduction course, uh, four credit hours. We aren't going to take four credit hours on this. We're going to try to blow through it in two. Um, but you have a hard copy of what we're talking about. You can reference it later, and you can rewatch this video if you're struggling as well. Um, in an ideal world, we'll actually maybe cover this again uh, in a more practical way where we're demonstrating it. Uh, when I get back, which could be really, really fun if you guys have a good baseline for what I'm talking about. All right, so let's go ahead and cruise through this. Learning objections, we're going to cover brief history and early founders. We're going to cover theory, research, and components. And then last but not least, we're going to cover learning paths and further education. As promised, if you really fell in love with this, how could you learn more? How could you get into it? That's what we're going to do, okay? Uh, a lot of this stuff doesn't apply to you guys so much because it's uh, related to the NBCC certification standards for continuing education. Uh, but you can read through it if you like. Uh, so first of all, we'll talk about the first early founder in neurofeedback is actually arguably Joe Camilla. And Joe Camilla uh, was, um, he was a therapist, like an actual therapist therapist. He was more on the spectrum of um, kind of the new emerging therapies, um, a little bit more woo-woo <laughs> to some people, I would say, who are in the research field. Joe Camilla practiced biofeedback, probably when it was at its most popular. Um, and he was pretty fixated on brainwaves and, and the consideration as to whether brainwaves could be conditioned. Um, and we didn't know a lot about brainwaves. And brainwaves are, you know, they arguably were discovered in the early 1800s. Um, 
but no, no really association in terms of function at this point. So Joe Camilla made an observation that if you close your eyes, there's this nice slow 10 hertz frequency that becomes really obvious and it sets itself apart. He also noticed that uh, the more relaxed a person was, and I think he noticed this because he was a biofeedback therapist and because he was a therapist, um, he was able to associate that, you know, if someone's more relaxed, they can actually produce that 10 hertz frequency with their eyes open. They can even produce more of it with their eyes closed if they're more relaxed, if he's doing therapeutic exercises with them. So Joe Camilla created a device that would give you positive feedback if you were producing that 10 hertz frequency. And uh, half, about half of his subjects reported feeling very euphoric and like they were, a very common report was that they felt like they were flying or floating while they were doing these exercises with the extra biofeedback on the brain waves. Um, and and that, that was interesting and it, it caught a lot of people's attention. Um, but it wasn't like groundbreaking or astonishing. It didn't really make waves. Uh, Joe Camilla did, however, publish some work on uh, the associative behavior of 10 hertz to calm, uh, um, uh, alert relaxation. So not drowsy, uh, not sleepy, but alert, but deeply relaxed. Uh, he associated the alpha 10 hertz frequency for um, uh, for uh, you know for, for 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 that relaxed state, and he became uh, fairly popular for that. Um, he might not have been the only one doing that research, you know, upon reflection, but um, but he did become fairly popular for some of those studies, and uh, made some other people a little jealous. <laughs> so uh, one of those jealous individuals uh, was Barry Sternman. And Barry Sternman. Uh, decided that he wanted to uh, associate a slightly faster frequency uh, with uh, behavior. So what he did was he took a whole bunch of cats, uh, and you can see the picture on your screen right there. He took a whole bunch of cats and he put them in these glass boxes and he hooked their, the center of their head up to a sensor and he had this electrical device called an EEG produce something similar to a seismograph. It's producing these waves amplifying the behavior and, and demonstrating on a piece of paper. So if they produce a certain frequency in the brain, it's manifested by a certain frequency interval on the seismograph. Uh, Barry Sternman in the 1960s, uh, 1950, I believe it's actually 1956 is when he actually did the study, um, uh, was able to positively associate the beta wave to alert readiness. And uh, this was most evident when uh, a mouse would run through or a mouse was maybe released near the cats and when the cats would notice the rat or the mouse they would get into that kind of perched position like they were hunting and all the cats that were in this hunting mode were producing this beta wave which would cause this light to go on so essentially when the rat is running through the cages all the lights in the room are on because all of the cats are producing beta in their brain and then when the beta frequency in the cat's brain starts to reduce, then the light bulbs start to turn off. So they're, they're giving what we call feedback. So they're on when the behavior's on and they're off when the behavior's off, uh, which is you know, a, a, essentially the principle behind biofeedback. Um, so biofeedback on blood pressure would mean that something would alarm me if my blood pressure got too high. Maybe it would start to ring or buzz. Um, if I got too stressed, maybe I'm producing too much sweat, a device on my wrist would watch the conductivity of my skin, which is essentially watching what we call the Galsavic skin response. It would see how much sweat I'm producing on the pore level, uh, and it would alert me that I'm becoming too stressed. Um, other things like heart rate variability well, let me know that my central nervous system is getting less regulated or uh, there's, there's poor communication in the vagal nerve or there's not enough vagal activation, uh, that the heart and the brain are not communicating as appropriately as they could or should. And it would prompt me through a buzz or a ring to stop and take some deep breaths. So depending on what you're giving feedback to, um, the window by which we might get back could be slightly different. And that's, same with, that's the same with brainwaves. Um, you might make the argument that brainwaves are further up uh, stream or further, <laughs> further up 
uh, causally, you know, in relationship to symptoms like stress um, or anxiety or depression, which may be true. Um, I think that's a good argument. But let's say we produce these electrical activities in our brain, and one of them is a little bit of a fast frequency, and every time we produce that frequency in the brain, a light bulb goes on, and every time that behavior in the brain reduces, the light bulb goes off. And we see it just kind of mimic that behavior. And we figure out what that behavior is associated with. In the case of cats, it's associated with alert readiness. Uh, Barry became pretty popular for that study. Um, I, I think it may have even been uh, the reason why he got a grant with NASA six years later in 1962, I believe. Um, basically, NASA was struggling with some of their astronauts in orbit. Um, some of the astronauts were seeing things they shouldn't see. They were hearing things uh, or, or, or believing things they shouldn't believe. One example would be an astronaut that actually looked down you know, from orbit on Australia and said, Ah, I can see somebody walking around down there. And obviously he, he couldn't be able to see someone that far up. It's there. They should be too small for him to see. Uh, and, and so one, he, he's not actually seeing someone. So we have hallucinations and two, he shouldn't be able to think he can see somebody. So we have delusions. So, you know, there's, there's also some uh, uh, evidence that the Russians were having similar problems. So they became this little race to figure out who could figure it out first. The running theory was that the rocket fuel that's used to get into orbit, monomethylhydrazine, was leaking into the cabin, and that uh, astronauts were, were actually breathing trace amounts of monomethylhydrazine, which was causing uh, small amounts of epilepsy, which was responsible for uh, the hallucinations and the delusions. And they believed it also uh, accounted for what I believe some written, some wrote uh, as, as observing facial tics and, and increased salivation which, uh, which I, uh, I, I believe I've read accounts of that. Um, uh, so Barry Sternman, who was at this point a popular researcher, uh, was given a contract by NASA to take 50 cats and expose them to monomethylhydrazine and to observe their brain and behavior to see if it correlates with what the astronauts are experiencing. So Barry takes these 50 cats, he puts them in these boxes, he hooks them up to their, uh, the EEG device, and he injects them with 10 cc's of monomethylhydrazine, which is not something we would do today. You know, <laughs> that was way before my time. <laughs> um, but what happened was that 40 out of the 50 cats started to produce uh, epilepsy in their brain. Uh, they noticed the, the other associative features like the ticks and the increased salivation. And so the belief was that they are in fact suffering from monomethylhydrazine poisoning, which is causing seizures or minor epilepsy, which is causing the delusions and the hallucinations. NASA at that point, I assume, wanted to know what uh, threshold would incapacitate the astronauts so they could judge how much time they had to solve the problem or maybe determine if the problem got worse, how fast they would have to suit up uh, before it would incapacitate them. So Barry continued to raise the dose on the cats from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40, eventually 50 milligrams of monomethylhydrazine rocket fuel. Uh, the end result was at 50 milligrams that 40 out of the 50 cats were dead or dying of grand mal seizures, and 10 cats were still not sick. Some of them were barely producing uh, the epilepsy that was observed at the smallest dose initially, and some were not struggling with epilepsy at all yet. Um, and that, that's a pretty dramatic outlier that, that needed an explanation. And it was a substantial difference in 20% of the, the study group, extremely resilient to, to, to this toxin and to seizures. Um, so they conducted an audit to try to determine what these 10 cats had in common that set them apart from the other 40. And what they found was that th those 10 cats that were seizure resistant and toxic resistant, and, and only those 10 cats, had been in Barry Sternman's sensory motor rhythm brain study on the beta association with the picture that you see there before we talked about. 
that the cats that had their brain wave represented uh, by a light bulb were essentially the ones that were resilient. Now, I don't, I don't really believe that Barry's uh, intention at that time was to actually condition the cat's brain to produce more of that beta wave. I don't think that's what he was going for. Um, the sensory motor rhythm is the beta wave, by the way, if there was some confusion there. Um, I don't think Barry Sternman actually intended to change uh, the brain behavior of the cats. I think he was just trying to use that light bulb to help the scientists associate behavior uh, to brain behavior so that it was supposed to be feedback for the researchers and the research assistants. Uh, but it somehow seemingly became feedback to the cat's own brain about the cat's own brain behavior. Um, a feedback loop is essentially information about the world that changes your behavior, that changes information about the world that changes your behavior. So I get a feedback loop when I look in the mirror. Okay, so if I look in the mirror and my facial expressions change based on what I'm observing, um, and then I'm observing the change in my facial expressions as well. We've established a feedback loop. <laughs> and I, I, I won't go, I could go further into that for like an hour, but I, but I won't. You can ask me about that on your own time if you're interested. There's, there's a lot of interesting things happening with a mirror. Um, but, but back on topic, why would having a light bulb represent a behavior in the brain cause cats to be seizure resistant and toxin resistant or toxin resistant. Um, that's, that's odd. That's really odd. So apart from understanding the cause, I think one of the most, you know, significant things that Barry wanted to determine is could this be reproduced? So one of the first things that Barry Sternman did was, um, you know, he got a bunch more cats and he put some of them, in the boxes where they were, you know, uh, having that feedback loop with the light bulb, the light bulb would go on when they produced the right frequency. I think he tried a whole bunch of different things too. I think he, he had the device drop food when they produced the brainwave behavior. Um, you know, uh, he, he, I think he tried a whole bunch of different approaches. But what he wanted to determine was, could he predict which cats would have seizures and which cats would be seizure resistant? And sure enough, he could. He could predict. Um, and it, it also is probably worth mentioning that uh, the placebo is very, 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 very strong, especially in um, unique modalities that are kind of you know, novelty. Um, but even though that's very, very true, it's somewhere between 20 and 40 percent with, with, a, with a maximum theoretical cap that's ever been observed of 50 percent. Um, there isn't actually a placebo effect on cats and toxic response. And just let that sink in for a second. Cats don't have a placebo to poison and treatments for poison. It's a placebo-free study. It isn't something that we observe or talk about in our research classes very often, like how to get around the placebo. And part of it is because that we now are more conscientious about animal cruelty um, in animal testing. And it kind of, it kind of you know, it's, it's fascinating though that there's a way to get around the placebo and see things more objectively. Um, and uh, it, turns, it turns out that, that this is one of those things. Uh, so for a long time there, uh, neurofeedback was conducted uh, quite a bit on cats, um, quite extensively on cats. And there was some research on dogs, though that wasn't preferred because the shape of their head varied too much. So it wasn't as easy to find the same placement on the brain as it was for cats where their head is always the same dimensions. It's one interesting fact about cats. Um, they also did quite a bit of research uh, and treatment on horses. Uh, they found uh, over the, the next few decades in neurofeedback research that if they did some of these trainings with horses who were, say, really popular racehorses um, that broke their leg on a race and then wouldn't race again and wouldn't breed again. But if they did a whole bunch of this treatment or this training, that some of these horses would start to run again 
and some of them would start to breed again. And, uh, you know, even if you couldn't get the horse to run again, they usually get it to breed again. And that's still pretty significant. Um, you know, a, 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 you know, a very popular racehorse that'll start to breed again. Sometimes those stud fees can be a million dollars. So, I mean, there's a lot of money invested in getting a horse to breed again. That's got what we now might think of as PTSD from, from a broken leg. It's, you know, that's part of the reason why they put horses down, by the way, um, after they, after they sustain a severe injury. It's not that they can't heal. It's that they are never useful again. They, they will not, uh, um, uh, you know, they, they didn't know how to rehabilitate them. <laughs> uh, and Mineral Feedback did spend quite a bit of time rehabilitating genuine racehorses for a while there, which I think is pretty weird. <clears throat> um, a lot of things were discovered over the next couple years. Uh, Joe Labar, he found that there was a ratio of slow wave theta and this beta wave that we just talked about, this, this the beta wave in cats, that if you, if you had twice as much theta, which is slower, as you did the beta that we were trying to train up in the cats, um, that you essentially could be, we could predict that you would meet criteria for ADHD. Um, and so Joe Lubar, I believe, is the one responsible for that research. I've met Joe personally. He's a great guy. Well, I've met all these people personally. But, um, but Joe Lubar, uh, you know, created that, that treatment, which is perhaps one of the biggest technological jumps uh, outside of Barry Sternman's initial discovery in the early years uh, that started to put neurofeedback on the map. Um, and Joe Lubar's research, I believe, led to an efficacy rating out of four out of five in the early to mid-1980s. No one really noticed. Uh, which is huge, wildly unfortunate, by the way. <laughs> Neurofeedback wouldn't have, uh, say, more public recognition until um, until around, around, I think, about 2000, uh, 2014, where it got an efficacy of five out of five for ADHD, uh, which, uh, you know, that somehow managed to, to, to hit the medical community fast. <laughs> um, but think about the, the time difference here. You know, we are in the early 1960s, and uh, neurofeedback would not really make its debut publicly for 50 years. I'm not going to go into the politics of all that, um, but that should bother us a little bit, <laughs> especially if you could, say, conduct research in a way that was, say, placebo-free, um, that showed substantial improvement for something as problematic and debilitating as, say, seizures. And you might ask yourself the question of like, well, if it works on cats, will it work on humans? Well, guess what? The research says it does. Um, you know, obviously you're dealing more with the placebo uh, with say uh, a, a human being than you are a cat, um, but there's still large studies and there's still, there's still double blind studies and triple blind studies. Um, there's enough of them to form meta-analysis and efficacy ratings. Um, you know, you, you can nitpick it a little bit, but uh, you get to work really hard. I know some people try, but, but uh, they don't make a good argument. <laughs> um, we can talk a lot more about that, but, but we're going to move on, okay? Just for the sake of time. Uh, let's talk about Margaret Ayers. Margaret Ayers is probably the next significant person to, to hit the show. Uh, I think it was around in the 1980s. I'm not exactly sure on the exact dates. You can look it up in the book, The Symphony of the Brain, um, which is cited at the very end. <clears throat> but Margaret Ayers, uh, she managed to get a contract to uh, retain one of Barry Sturman's devices for conducting neurofeedback. He was, again, Barry, Barry Sturman did research on this for decades and decades. Um, so as long as she paid a couple hundred dollars to Barry Sturman, she had access to this device. Um, and the contract didn't really restrict her from using it um, in a lot of the ways that Barry probably intended to restrict. Um, and I'm not sure how that occurred, but Margaret Ayers essentially had um, as long as she made her payments, unlimited access to this device that she could use in the way that she felt she could. So Margaret Iris started her own neurofeedback clinic. And um, again, if you want to do some more reading on that, I'm sure there's published data out there and, and there's miscellaneous stuff that might be pretty hard to find. The easiest place to get information or find those citations is going to be the symphony of the brain. Uh, where her story will be a little more detailed. Um, Margaret Ayers worked with autism, autistic spectrum. She worked with ADHD. 
and she had a knack for waking up coma patients, uh, which was also very fascinating. And, and some of those uh, occurrences where she woke up someone who had a coma uh, through conditioning their brain waves, so essentially conditioning down anything that looks like sleep and conditioning up anything that looks like being awake, uh, something like that. Um, some of those were observed by quite a few number of doctors and have a number of accounts written, uh, and I'm sure that some of them are published. And if, if, if those publications can be looked up, I think the, the Symphony of the Brain would be a great place to start to find those citations. Um, by the way, anything on here, which there's many of them that have uh, little numbers, you can go to the back of the, the, the booklet and, and find a citation for pretty much every paragraph has a citation. So you're welcome to use that if you're interested or if you would like to um, if you would like to uh, further research the topic for any reason. Um, so Margaret Ayers, she worked with a family called the Othmers. The Othmers had um, a severely autistic nonverbal child who had grand mal seizures. It's not typical, it's not, it's not atypical, so it's common to have, say, uh, someone who is uh, non-verbally autistic and have seizures, those two, you know, are highly comorbid. Uh, it helped their child significantly. And um, they decided to make Margaret Ayers a proposal to try to reverse engineer um, or, or build their own EEG device, um, computerize it, so they had a computer interface, um, and something that could be distributed, uh, trained, and sold. I think they created something called uh, Full Spectrum EEG Clinic, uh, which I believe still exists today. They don't run it. They run something else, but, but that still exists today. Uh, I forget the name of the individual who, who purchased it. We'll talk more about that later. <clears throat> um, but anyways, uh, I don't recommend that you go into business with your clients. Um, there's laws against that for good reason. <laughs> and, and some of these played out uh, exactly how you would expect and that there was disagreements and contentions and, and, and hesitations. And for whatever reason, Margaret did not want at the last minute, she did not actually want to produce and sell and train new clinicians. Um, I don't know what her motive is. I, I can only speculate because Margaret passed away. Ed Billingham, who did the programming and engineering for the hardware, also passed away, so we can't really ask him. The only, the only people who can speak to Margaret's intentions are the Othmers, and they are um, generously kind towards her, from what I understand, which, so, so I, don't, I don't know that they would speak ill of her. <laughs> but I, we, we can only wonder. Uh, but Margaret Ayers did not want to disseminate the equipment. This is about 1989, I believe, uh, so it led to several lawsuits, and in the end, uh, the judge decided that Ed Billingham and the author family both had a share each of the company and Margaret Ayers had a share of her own. So Ed and the Othmers were able to outvote Margaret um, and they were able to essentially retain the rights of the EEG equipment and immediately followed with a um, bankruptcy <laughs> from all the legal fees and uh, that E full spectrum EEG was sold to uh, an individual who, who I personally met and talked to on the phone a few times. And I'm just facing his name right now. Nice guy, very nice guy. But he still owns that company today. Uh, the Othmers turned around and I believe were able to uh, rebuild and, and, and continue uh, creating equipment and software after that moment, from what I understand. <clears throat> so the Othmers to this day still manufacture equipment. Uh, I still connect with them on a regular basis. I had an employee who was at their training just last week and spent quite a bit of time with Secret Othmer, Sue Othmer, and Kurt Othmer. Um, <clears throat> they're all good people, and their equipment are, are well worth considering if you're choosing to get into this industry. We'll talk more about that at the end. <clears throat> uh, the Othmers, uh, many credit them with the discovering of the intra-low training. We're not going to get into that right now, but it's uh, the type of neurofeedback that... Uh, can be done with less assessment costs. Uh, it's more manually optimized, tedious finesse required, but you can save a lot of money and you can get a lot, you can get a lot more powerful effects uh, in a shorter period of time if you know what you're doing and if you're talented. But we're not gonna go into that right now. <clears throat> 
So what is neurofeedback? Again, neurofeedback is feedback about the brain to the brain. And, and how that's actually experienced, you can see this diagram down here. Uh, the MindLift provided this and gave me permission to, to offer this to you, by the way. Um, but it watches the brain waves from the head, goes to an amplifier, this little green box down here, amplifies the signal and digitizes the signal, sends it to the computer for analysis, and the computer sends back the feedback decisions to the monitor, to the audio, and oftentimes to this tactile feedback, so some sort of like vibrating pillow that will say increase the amount of vibration or decrease the amount of vibration, depending on whether it's rewarding or inhibiting or doing nothing. So uh, it could be as simple as doing exactly what Barry Sturman did with the cats, right at the top of the head. We'll watch and see, is that brainwave spindling or is it producing amplitude? If it's producing the beta wave, then the screen is clear and open. You hear the music, you see some pretty imagery. Maybe you're watching Netflix and you can see your TV show clearly. If the brainwave reduces, the screen narrows, it turns gray, the sound volume decreases, the teddy bear starts to vibrate less. And these things will continue to change in real time somewhere between 50 millionths of a second to 200 thousandth of a second. And it needs to be stable, which means it's gotta be somewhere in that range, but it also needs to not vary within that range unless you want your client to get nauseous and throw up. <laughs> so you want a stable, consistent feedback loop with a, with a, within a specific, um, with a specific latency that's stable, so it doesn't vary. And uh, this is a part of classical or operant conditioning. So it's very similar if you've studied biofeedback. Um, it plays on the, uh, um, the understanding that we have of neuroplasticity. The brain's connections or synapses migrate and grow. The brain, uh, the brain has a strong ability to change itself and it has the desire to be healthy and efficient. And part of that healthy and efficiency is a natural uh, occurrence from Newton's third law of balance and incoming stimulus. So as, it's, as new incoming stimulus causes the brain to be activated and have variability, and Newton's third law tends to keep it structured and balanced uh, and within some sort of normal parameters, hopefully. Well, obviously there's lots of examples where that's not working well. And, you know, most extreme examples being one to the spectrum coma and the other end of the spectrum seizures. Uh, and everything in the middle that represents like autoimmune issues and um, depression and uh, um, neurological disorders and anxiety, diagnosable disorders, I mean, anything you can think of. And, and not everything that people suffer with is probably a result of a brain disorder. Um, everything can be treated through some efficiency, uh, but some things have their origin in, say, uh, poor beliefs about the world. They're not objectively seeing the world correctly. When you look at something like PTSD, it's like, hey, we actually have some specific things that we could fix here to help them reorient. Uh, some people, the brain is working and doing its thing, uh, but they're misinterpreting the signals. Maybe anxiety is the, you got to actually go break up with your girlfriend. <laughs> and maybe that's what anxiety is telling you to do. And maybe the problem is that you're not doing it. <laughs> and so, it's not always the brain's fault, <laughs> but, um, but uh, uh, it, could be, it could be about habits, behaviors, beliefs, patterns, uh, skills, um, or attachment. It could be about something that, that's not rooted in the brain. And so whenever you're doing this kind of work, it's, it's easy to get narrowly focused on the brain as being maybe the source of everything. Uh, and that's, that's, half, that's, that's probably half true, uh, but you're gonna get the best results if you, if you think of psychotherapy and the brain. As, as two complementing modalities, one, two sides of a coin. You gotta do them both. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So we did cover this a little bit, but how do we know it's not the placebo effect? Um, and again, you can look into studies that are double blind, triple blind studies, and look at meta-analysis studies. There's arguably like over 50, 60 uh, efficacies that neurofeedback has. Depending on how critical you wanna be of those, uh, those efficacy, stu efficacy studies, it'll vary. 
um, there's quite a few, like in 2000, I think 13 or 15, when we had the big efficacy rating for ADHD. I don't know that a lot of people actually question that one, which is really, really nice. <laughs> if some, some leg will stand on. Um, there's maybe two or three studies that are uh, overtly negative towards neurofeedback. And a lot of those are kind of easily explained, sadly. I mean, I think I had an intern that, that was really disturbed by one. I was like, okay, well, go get the original PDF and read it, and then I'll let you tell me what's wrong with it. And <laughs> sure enough, they were like, I can't believe I didn't just read that. That's a terrible study. Like, yeah, it was a terrible study. It had two active treatments, three placebo. They did like five to 10 sessions only. They didn't do 20 to 60, which is typically researched. They didn't do any follow-up. They didn't do any cognitive uh, uh, you know, testing like a CPT test, which is industry standard. So no pre, it was, it was, it was like a symptom checklist like a month after they started, which is not enough time um, with too small of a sample group. <laughs> it's like, and then their conclusions at the end of that study were everything related to neurofeedback including all previous research is due to the placebo. And it's like, I don't know that you've actually done enough work to, uh, to validate that claim, um, which uh, that uh, I think the peer reviewed status of that study was, was actually redacted <laughs> following um, many of us complaining um, in great shock that it was ever published. <clears throat> but uh, um, it's one of those things that uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of politics in this industry. We don't really know why. Um, I could speculate, but I'm not going to do that right now. <clears throat> uh, but but I've not seen a, a, a reputable counter study that had uh, continuous performance testing or follow up or reasonable amount of sessions. So um, if you had you know even just one of those three, I think I'd be more nervous. But I've never seen a study that had any of those three. <laughs> so <laughs> it'd be it'd be ideal if you could do all of those three and still conclude that it's the placebo. Um, but again, I don't think we've even had one. So uh, and it, it doesn't stop uh, bad research from circulating the internet like wildfire somehow. Those things are still very, very popular. And I think a lot of you who, who have already become very passionate about other forms of treatment have likely made similar observations, um, like in, in fields like acupuncture, that, that, uh, that there is, um, say, uh, studies, Poorly, poorly done studies uh, to show poor results circulate a lot faster than enormous and strong studies that say positive effects. And that's just, I think, how it goes for alternative medicine right now. All right, so full spectrum EEG. Um, there's a lot of different behaviors in the brain and we are not going to cover all of them. So don't think this is comprehensive. Um, but there are a few more commonly known behaviors in the brain that could be or should be talked about. Um, you have delta brain waves, which relate more to sleep. And you can see this at the bottom of the page, by the way. Theta brain waves, which relate to feeling sleepy and are also strongly associated with creative uh, or potentially even um, uh, deeply unconscious learned behaviors. Um, we might get into that a little bit later. Alpha, which is uh, awake and resting, um, and then beta, which is typically associated with uh, alert readiness or awake with mental activity. Um, low beta, which is thought to be a very productive frequency, is typically produced if like you were, say, taking an exam that you knew you knew the information on, you were very confident, you are like there for performance. Um, or if, you're, or if you're, you're engaging in a sport that you're very proficient in and you believe you are going to win. Um, higher, higher beta relates to more higher stress. And, and, and we're speaking of this fairly one-dimensionally because the game changes and what these four things mean, as soon as we talk about different locations, take on different nuances. And sometimes like for example, alpha, which sounds great, awake and resting, it's, we're not going to get into this, but that's that sounds good, but it's actually not good depending on where it is in the brain. The same thing with beta or delta or theta or any of it. It could be really good uh, depending on where it is and it could be really bad depending on where it is. And there isn't time to cover that, unfortunately. <laughs> that's, uh, there's a lot more information there that, that, uh, that you can't possibly absorb. So let's talk about locations for a second. Here's uh, something for you to follow along with about what locations in the brain relate to what kind of function. 
and different frequencies tend to be more dominant depending on the location. And there's some relative norms for what we understand should be where. And uh, not everybody fits the relative norm perfectly. And there's some debate out there as to whether we should want to fit normal or not. I think that if you have, um, uh, say, a problem with, say, um, word choice, you know, Broca's area, uh, right here, that I have, I have a stutter or I can't find the right word um, or I use the wrong word, even though it has the right sound, I use the wrong word for my sentence, I choose the wrong word. This area right here, this Broca's area for speech, um, if we look there and we see something that validates, maybe there's too much theta or too much delta there or not enough beta or something is going on over there that seems to fit my symptoms, then maybe there's reason to train that back to or closer to something that's normal in hopes of getting those results that we want or hopes of normalizing speech. <clears throat> there's a lot of protocols like that and a lot of those kinds of protocols have led to efficacy studies. That's where we get the many, 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 many efficacies that we haven't discussed so far. Um, all right. Standardized placements are typically using the 1020 system, illustrated by the bottom right of page seven. They're all about an inch apart, represent about 10% of uh, the brain's distance between each sensor. Um, so you can think of it in terms of like a silver dollar uh, distance between everything. And that's how we capture or place sensors for treatment. We might capture, for example, uh, a map of the entire brain by placing a sensor on every single one of those red dots. And then uh, doing a special type of recording where we are uh, manually filtering out um, all of the eye blinks, all of the uh, jaw clinches, all the leg movements, anything that produces what we refer to as noise or artifacts. And so we have what we call raw EEG data, clean data. From that clean data, we can generate maps that can tell us whether or not their symptoms match a classic neurological imbalance which may be treated using operant or classical conditioning, aka neurofeedback. And all that stuff is pretty exciting. If when you when you when you get the right kind of patient with the right kind of issue and the assessment shows everything perfectly, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna fix this. Anyways, so let's look at the components here. Your electroencephalograph right here, this is an example of one of the devices that I own that the Offmers actually created. That's a NeuroAmp 2, and it's accompanying laptop. Um, that's actually the amplifier right there um, that will take the signal. Uh, it also checks to make sure that you uh, put the sensors on correctly. So it's got what we call an impedance meter. Then you got the sensors or electrodes, which you can see right below that. Those are those little sensors that stick to the head. You use a special little paste. First, you're gonna prep it with this thing called NeuroPrep. That's that white and green tube there. It's like an exfoliant with a little bit of sandy uh, application. It's gonna, it's gonna scrub away some of the dead skin cells and dry cells. And then you're gonna use the 1020, which is that white bottle there below it, which is actually a conductant electrolyte paste. It's kind of like a non-gritty, thicker toothpaste, which helps the, the sensor actually stay on and conduct the frequencies from the head uh, and, and deliver those to the amplifier. Um, you're gonna clean up afterwards using ice, isopropylene alcohol, which is that little bottle right below that. When you're doing the treatment, you can see the brain waves on the computer screen as represented at the bottom of age eight. That's kind of what they look like in general. Um, you know, depending on where you're looking, they're gonna look differently even if they're normal. So it takes a, a lot of training to know what you're looking at. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So why do people come to choose neurofeedback? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, even outside of say things that have efficacy rating or things that have been shown to work really, really well, um, and even, even apart from you know, things their friends or family have told them or what they've read, a lot of people come to neurofeedback because they've tried at least 10 other things that have failed them. And that's probably my typical client. I'm coming to you because I've been struggling for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I've seen 10 doctors, I've seen 10 therapists, I've seen 10 specialists. Um, and, and they, they just want, um, more hope <clears throat> and they want to get on their feet. 
you know, want to get better. And, uh, and they've been told potentially by the mainstream systems or, or maybe many other systems as well um, that they don't know how to help them or they can't help them or there is nothing left to do. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, there's a number of things like that which are pretty, you know, miserable situations like diabetic nerve pain, which <clears throat> we've seen absolutely astounding results on. Some of these individuals, they think, well, if you could fix this issue that I'm struggling with, you'll, you know, you'll be on the news. It's like, no, I promise you I won't be. <laughs> we, 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 we bump into these situations a lot, <laughs> you know. Um, those kinds of things are, are not uncommon at all. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, despite the fact that our clinical practice is full of individuals who have been struggling with, you know, 10 plus failures in a row, sometimes multiple decades of struggling, uh, doesn't mean that we have even even a moderate failure rate with our clients. <laughs> we, we, we tend to do very well. Um, <clears throat> and we tend to use more holistic approaches. We, we tend to stay away from brain mapping if we, if we can. Yeah, and that's another discussion for another time. Anyways, to give you an idea of where the research is, um, I have down here this link right above the word cloud novianscounseling.wixsite.com slash bibliography. That's a bibliography from, from 2009, which is fairly old, sadly, but it's a comprehensive bibliography on all the good research. I believe it's over 90 pages. So it's just a bibliography over 90 pages of just the research that we think is decent. Uh, it was put together through someone who um, was contributing to the uh, International Society of Neurofeedback Research. And you can also go and visit that uh, research foundation at isnr.org. But to make things a little simpler, I broke down these studies um, into categories. Um, and I uh, generate a word cloud based on how many were in each group. And so you can see down here um, kind of where people have put their effort in terms of research, ADHD and learning being one of the largest categories, the largest category, one of the easiest things to treat, thanks to Joe Labar. Um, cognitive improvement, epilepsy, um, those are some of the other two big ones there as well. And the list goes on and on and on and on about what we've, what we've chosen to research over the years. Uh, and, and, and that's since 2009, and since 2009, Neurofeedback has, has done a lot more work. Uh, we really, really need to see this upgraded because I'm sure that we probably doubled the amount of research um, just because of grant money and things like that uh, that we've achieved through um, all kinds of interesting means uh, since our efficacy has been established for ADHD, and when you, uh, established and acknowledged, I should say. <laughs> So how we can benefit, how we can maximize the benefits of neurofeedback, and this is where uh, some of you individuals who are like nutrition coaches or naturopaths um, or, or, or other modalities might really find their time to shine. Um, one, we have to coach the individual to report accurately, and then we have to take some responsibility on our own and to optimize the treatment, and that even even outside of some of the more traditionally optimized optimization-based treatments like the inflow that I do. You don't have to understand that, don't worry. Um, but even the more generic treatments that are more standardized, uh, they actually do benefit from optimizing things individually to each person. And uh, in order to learn how to do that, you have to have a pretty killer mentor. It's not easy to learn how to do that. Um, there, aren't, there aren't shortcuts. We'll, we'll go over that later, but there aren't shortcuts. The, the hard way is usually the best way and shortcuts are pretty rough. Um, they, they, they make some pretty astounding compromises, sadly. <clears throat> so during the treatment, you gotta coach your client how to refrain from clenching in addition to you know, being a good reporter, uh, clenching their teeth, uh, fidgeting too much, anything that really interferes with the EEG. And some, some treatments are more forgiving than others based on how they filter the data and based on what kind of data they're trying to interact with. That could be more or less important. Uh, but, but some coaching is still inevitably uh, part of the equation. Um, understanding, you know, what's going on uh, and understanding your own equipment is, is going to be a huge part of that. <clears throat> During the treatment day, it's, 
it's uh, it's important to, if they can, uh, refrain from over-the-counter medications. Sometimes neurofeedback can address a problem instead. Uh, you want to encourage them to continue to take all the prescription medications. Um, you know, if you are someone who can manage medications, uh, like a doctor, um, you can decide to amend that last one. But for those of you who um, do not regulate medication, uh, I would encourage you to stay far, far, far away from the discussion of medication because you might read and might learn things about like, hey, that med interferes with the treatment progress. And if you are tempted and you mention that to the client, the chances that they will just cold turkey stop that med are extremely high. Uh, and you do not want to be responsible for that. And so it's, it's best that they not know um, even what's getting in the way of treatment um, because it's very, very hard to... Um, you don't, yeah, you don't want to be responsible for what might happen if you tell them that information and it, it causes them to make choices around meds that they shouldn't be making. <clears throat> I'll just leave that there. All right. <clears throat> uh, it's in, now, the reason why you might not want to take over-the-counter medication, because not just because neurofeedback can, can potentially do something about something, like let's say I have a headache, which is something I treat myself for all the time. If I take Advil, and it gets rid of the headache, I won't really know whether the neurofeedback did that or the headache did it. And so one, there's a the benefit of knowing that it's doing something or, or having evidence that it's doing something significant. And two, my brain learns a lot more about regulating headaches when it can do so without an extra ingredient that is condition, can, that is, that is, that is uh, say, say an external variable. Uh, meaning that if I can train my brain to regulate away a headache that normally it can't, <laughs> um, then it might be able to learn how to do that on its own. Uh, but if there's an extra variable, an extra ingredient in the mix, um, it might not learn how to regulate as well, or it might not learn things of, of great importance for prevention uh, later. And <clears throat> I'm saying that very poorly, but, but we're just going to leave that there. That is, that is functionally how it plays out, even though it could be probably more articulately stated. <laughs> that uh, if the brain can learn to do something without chemical ingredients, then it probably can reproduce the effect on its own. Um, or you might be able to retrain the brain's default mode network to have less headaches or to not have headaches or to resolve headaches on its own um, because there wasn't, say, ibuprofen or Advil or something like that. And so we don't want to limit what we can gain from neurofeedback um, unintentionally. <clears throat> so again, that's only PRN or over-the-counter over the meds. Uh, make sure that they try to get a full night's sleep the day before and the day of, so when they leave. Uh, a lot of the brain's permanent changes are uh, arguably conducted uh, during REM sleep. <clears throat> uh, you want to make sure they eat about six to eight grams of extra protein the day of treatment. The brain does have to replenish and restore some of the brain-derived neurotropic factors that it releases during neurofeedback. Some of you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> um, uh, three days prior to treatment, you want to coach them to refrain from caffeine or alcohol, um, just so their brain is in an optimal mental state to learn. Uh, just during the entire during the entire portion of treatment, it's good to practice good nutrition, hydration. You know, take supplements recommended by the doctor. If you are a doctor, you can prescribe and optimize their nutrition and supplements and do their blood work. Uh, it can be enormous, enormously beneficial to ensuring that they get the most out of their treatment. And exercise is always good for changing the brain, so encouraging them to have a good exercise routine. If they do all these things, they're going to get the most out of it. And there's a lot of, say, um, competing variables for proving that it's doing what we said it should do or what we want it to do. Um, but sometimes we're not so interest, interested in proof of uh, it as a single variable, like a study. Sometimes you just want to get the individual in front of you the most benefit humanly possible because they need it. And, and so like a lot of these things are not going to be added to a study, uh, but they are going to be added to clinical practice. And that's actually the cool thing. If studies look good, your individual practice should be much, much better. And that's actually really significant. I don't think people talk about that in research classes, but, um, but research should be, um, you know, research is sterile. 
there's not a lot of room for individual optimization. There's not a lot of room for, for adding all kinds of other modalities to make everything work better. Um, but you can, and you should. You know, it shouldn't, shouldn't be sterile. It shouldn't be flat. It shouldn't be simple. It should be complex, and you should get the most out of it, and you should, you should show the, the most benefit in your clinic. All right. Um, these recommendations are usually passed down from mentor to student in training. Recommendation, recommendations may differ depending on who you study under. All of these lists from this page 10, by the way, I pulled from like literally seven or eight different studies. I'm pretty sure they're, did I cite them? You know, I think I gathered them over the years. Some of them, no, they are cited. Okay, good for me. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> some of them are. Uh, so some of them are just things I got from my mentor, which is why some of them might not be cited. Um, you can integrate other therapies into neurofeedback. The brain can actually do more than one thing at once. Uh, one that I typically integrate is heart rate variability biofeedback because it helps with a lot of that artifact and noise reduction. Um, it can also help with like if their shoulders are just tense, you might be seeing some of that interfering in the EEG, interfering in the brain waves. It might be uh, something that you're trying to treat through or can have it having you know to uh, contaminate your treatment. But that if you have them do these breathing exercises, that's watching their heart actually increase, heart rate is increasing as they inhale and decreasing as they exhale. And some people may know this already, but, but your heart can do that. And it's called heart rate variability. And it's, uh, I believe, primarily regulated by the vagal nerve. Um, but it's not so much regulated from the top down as much as is the bottom up. So you have these Bohr receptors in your carotid artery and in your lungs. And when you take a deep breath, these nerves in your lungs get stimulated from that deep breath movement, sends a signal over to your heart. Your heart starts having this uh, kind of um, maybe reactionary uh, regulatory uh, behavior as it starts to increase as you inhale and decrease its heart rate as you exhale. And devices can let you monitor that and watch that. And you can actually see your heart rate go up and down. Your regular EKG isn't, isn't actually going to capture this because I don't believe it has what we call um, sampling rate high enough. But if you get a sampling rate of 10 or higher, you know, um, you should be able to capture this. But it should increase and decrease um, as you inhale and exhale. And you will see proportionate changes in the default mode network of the brain as well. I regularly do exercise with people, I'll have them do breathing exercise for three or four minutes. Uh, sometimes I'll do, you know, more acute neurofeedback where I'm having them target one behavior in the brain and changing it. Sometimes I'll just have them do deep breathing and I'll observe the brain changes. Um, and all those things interact with each other. 80% of the information in the vagal nerve during this deep breathing is actually coming from the heart to the brain rather than the brain to the heart. Uh, which means that there's some regulation from bottom up. Uh, and your brain does actually have uh, its own central nervous system, which is fascinating, complicated. You know, someone mentioned uh, <clears throat> to me uh, just a couple of days ago that there's just as much neurons in your body as there are in your brain. And I, I, I said, okay, great, that's awesome. Find me a citation because I've got to add that to my material if that's true, but I need to read through it because that sounds crazy. There are, regardless, an enormous absolutely enormous amount of neurons in your heart, an enormous amount of neurons in your gut. And then there's this loose, loosely interconnected neuron system in your skin as well. And so your entire body uh, arguably is a brain. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's not always the same density. It's not always the same function, obviously. Um, but there's quite a few uh, ways in science that we're not going to go into or you can demonstrate how there are decisions by the body all the time um, that cause reactionary states like pulling your hand away from a hot metal, uh, you know, like a hot iron, that there isn't enough time for the brain to get that information and to, and to send a signal back to respond. A lot of that is, um, you know, very somatic response. And, and there are neurons that, that made that conclusion, this is hot, pull away. Um, some of those reactionary tendencies. So some people use audio-visual systems or audio-visual stimulation. Uh, I believe you should have learned a little bit about this from Emily Hostler. She probably brought in her David system for you to look at and play with. Hopefully that's true. <clears throat> and some of those can be used before neurofeedback. Some variations might be able to be used during neurofeedback. And someday I'm sure we'll blend the two. 
talk therapy. Not all types of neurofeedback are eligible for talk therapy because talking might interfere with some of the frequencies that we're working with. Um, but, but there are some versions of neurofeedback where you could do some versions of talk therapy during the treatment. And that allows you to establish or, or work on the other side of the coin. Again, fixing the brain or changing uh, their perception about the sensations that they're experiencing. <clears throat> to practice neurofeedback, most states require you to have a healthcare license of some kind. I don't think that's true anymore. I know Washington doesn't have it regulated anymore. I think it did in the past, but it's not anymore. I don't believe it's regulated in Oregon or Washington. Some states do regulate it. I actually genuinely hope that they start regulating it <laughs> for a lot of reasons, but I, 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 I fear that it's going in the opposite direction where it's going to be less regulated rather than more regulated. Um, that's something you want to definitely check in in your local state, figure out what your requirements are. Integrations of neurofeedback and counseling. Uh, I believe that sometimes counseling should be required to do neurofeedback, meaning that some types of disorders and some types of treatments, um, like alpha theta, you should be seeing a talk therapist in addition to doing neurofeedback because it will be bringing stuff up. Not all treatments are going to do that. Not all treatments are, are going to uh, rock the boat or, 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 un, or stir up some unconscious you know, childhood feelings. Um, you have to know a lot about the type of neurofeedback that you're doing to know if you need to be concerned about that. And again, it's de depending on what you're doing. It's 100% dependent on what you're doing. Some, some treatments, you'd be insane not to have them do talk therapy in addition to the treatment. And you might want to have them do a lot of talk therapy before they start doing that particular treatment. Um, and some, it's like anybody could do it. It doesn't matter. It's like the sensory motor rhythm treatment or the beta treatment that, that varies to me with the cats. It's like, I don't have any concerns about that. That's good for everybody. Uh, it's one of the few treatments that you can't really overdo either. You could do a lot of that and it would be just fine for anybody to do a lot of that treatment. Um, especially if you optimize it a little bit for each person, I don't think they can overdo it. But there are treatments you can definitely overdo and there are treatments that can stir up childhood memories and stir up old feelings and can make you less dissociative, which could be a really, really scary thing for somebody in the short run. And you need someone to walk them through that and hold containment. So, you know, don't jump into that <laughs> unless you know what you're doing. <clears throat> okay, let's see here. Some practitioners believe that abreactions, which abreactions are the uh, unconscious somatic experiences uh, like uh, odd physiological sensations, memories, dreams, body memories, all kinds of odd feelings, behaviors that they might, they might have or see. Um, uh, changes in their thinking, um, things that, the ab reactions are basically abnormal reactions, which is a, it's a neurological term, referring to someone processing childhood emotions without knowing what memory they are attributed to. Um, so you might want to replay that and think about that again, but childhood memories that are being processed without knowing what they are attributed to. And those can be misinterpreted, misunderstood, or framed poorly, poorly, related to poorly, that you as a therapist are responsible for framing those for them and giving them containment, uh, helping them lean into some of those processing rather than becoming fearful or avoidant. And some of those coaching is incredibly important um, if you want your clients to get better or to not run away when they're doing some of the best work they could or should be doing. You don't want to lose them because they didn't understand what was happening. Uh, okay, sometimes uh, ab reactions uh, are a result from past trauma. Steps can be taken to minimize or stop ab reactions. You know, it'd be ideal to help them reframe them. I might, I might rewrite this. <laughs> uh, processing an ab reaction may provide a beneficial opportunity to learn something significant about themselves. This is very, very true. We do a lot more of the second one, uh, way more these days than, than, any, than, I, than, than the first one. We don't try to stop them or minimize them, really. I can't think of a time where we have done that lately. Um, all right, neurofeedback uh, trains a person to regulate their neurological and physiological function, both autonomic and conscious. However, it does not promote the processing of emotions or thinking errors, nor does it provide an adequate platform of self-expression, self-exploration, or self-discovery. Neurofeedback is helpful to, counselor, to the counseling process, but neurofeedback does not qualify as a substitute for counseling. 
practitioners should not work with patients that are outside of their scope of practice. Just spend a little bit of time thinking about that. The practitioner may need to require that the patient receive appropriate counseling to continue or start treatment. Having that policy as a part of your informed consent is very important. All right, so let's go down here. Counseling offered for integration or in addition to neurofeedback. Um, we probably covered some of this stuff here. Mm. Yeah, we're good. Well, we can read through that in your own time if, if we may not have covered all that, but I believe we've covered a lot of that. Okay, there's a lot of different modalities. I want to first apologize, they're not all listed here. And two, I've changed my opinions on some of these since I wrote this. This is actually a very old version of, of the pamphlet that I'm giving you. I have another one that's over 100 pages long now. Uh, that one's actually going to get published here shortly. <clears throat> but infralow and slow cortical potentials, there's a couple of different variations. That's the one where if you have the finesse and skill and talent, uh, you can save a lot of time and a lot of money on assessment um, to get results faster. Um, but it's high stakes, high reward. You just got to know what you're doing. So your skill makes a big difference. Um, that's working with deeper frequencies in the brain that actually come from the white matter instead of the gray matter. It's really complex, cool stuff. Um, DC current frequencies instead of AC current frequencies. Totally different game. Alpha theta. This is the one that has been associated with the most ab reactions. And uh, I do speak publicly a lot on this, even though we're not going to cover this right now. Um, I probably speak a couple different times on the West Coast, uh, a couple times a year, uh, just on alpha theta and, and what we can be doing to use it for uh, dissociative patients and PTSD patients and things like that. Um, but that one's probably the most, uh, you need the most amount of training around. And not just any training, you, you need a pretty brilliant mentor to do that because uh, standardization is something that um, I'm quite established for alpha theta. Um, I'm pretty happy with our results, but. Uh, but as I said, I, I, uh, well, I won't go into all that right now. <laughs> theta beta ratio training, pretty safe to use. Um, it's not the most holistic approach, but it is a way to get very, very consistent results. Um, if you apply it very poorly, you'll probably get results about 75% of the time for attention deficits or some sort of traumatic response disorders. You can get some great results with that too, about 75% of the time. If you have best practice and good training, you might see closer to 90%, maybe 87%, I think, the Thompson Clinic reported, and they, they probably practice it the best. Um, it doesn't, doesn't quite see 100% success rate with ADHD, though. Um, I haven't actually published my own work yet, um, but we actually have not had a client not show substantial improvement on their continuous performance testing, which we'll talk about shortly meaning that every client that's come to me for attention deficits has shown a uh, substantial improvement using uh, a test with great retest testability. We haven't had a single client not improve. Over the years, we've had a few, like two or three, that didn't, and we referred them to a doctor to get a blood test and found that they were, say, no testosterone or iron toxic or anemic or uh, no thyroid. And, and uh, in most cases with maybe uh, maybe one exception, they resolved the issue, came back, got the treatment, and then got the results they wanted following resolution of, um, and it's, it's hard to know whether their scores were so bad because they were low or high on what they were, their blood work was. So, you know, maybe, maybe the best practice, I don't know if we've ever done this or not, but the best practice would be to, I think we had one, we had one case where we tested after their blood work was better just so we could see how much the blood work helped and then do the treatment and then redo the test a third time, which is a lot to ask of a client. Those tests are hard. Um, but to see the difference with the blood work improvement and then the difference uh, with the neurofeedback and the better blood work. So you have kind of like, you know, uh, some really cool data that would be a really fun case study if you wanted to publish it. There's all of those kinds of things happen on a regular, regular basis where it's like, wow, this is really cool. You know. <laughs> Uh, sensory motor rhythm training, we've talked a lot about that. That's the beta waves of the cats. Again, that one is pretty simple. Um, there's definitely devices out there that, that you could own for just a little bit of money where you could do that training at home on your own. Um, it's the only one I recommend that you sh could do non-clinically. I don't recommend non-clinical systems at all, with maybe this exception. 
uh, brain mapping is more of assessment, though there are versions of brain mapping where you can do treatment at the same time. Those are referred to as S. Loretta. I don't believe they're covered in this because it's an old document. Uh, we have an S. Loretta system that I might show you. Uh, so you could train the whole brain at once, not just a few locations. <laughs> Um, again, it's the, the process of acquiring 19 channels worth of data at once. Uh, and the reason why it's called a 1020 is because usually there's a reference, you're filtering out like your heart rate and other bio signals from the ear to where you're capturing and filtering them. Uh, we won't go into that science. If you want to understand the math behind how we do that, I'm more than happy to explain that. Any part of this, there's a pretty good chance I can explain it, so just feel free to ask me. Lens or low energy neurofeedback systems. I have a system that can actually conduct lens, but I don't do it yet. Um, I, 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 it makes me pretty nervous. It's high stakes, high reward. Uh, maybe 90, 80% of your patients get better very quickly, very, very quickly. And maybe 5% get worse permanently, <laughs> which is why I'm nervous about it. I wouldn't tolerate that kind of side effect. Uh, and maybe that's just a, a, an aspect of research. Maybe it could be mediated if done um, say more optimally with an individual, but I'd have to be convinced by a really talented mentor that, that we wouldn't fall into those, those kinds of statistics before I'd be willing to consider it. Uh, but lens is actually doing neurofeedback, but the conditioning factor is actual electricity conditioning the brain and how and why uh, I can't speak to. This isn't like the alpha stem, that Emily showed you. This is something else. Um, this is conditioning, and this is conditioning the default mode network of the individual based on what the electrodes actually see and what the computer decides is good or bad behavior. Um, I can't speak to much of this system. I've met a few individuals that impressed me who conduct lens, um, but I get a lot of patients running away from lens clinics to my clinic, and I have to fix them because they got worse. Um, so again, I'm not going to do that system until I can be assured that I'm not going to be like them. Um, all right. So there's a lot of other kinds of treatments, near infinite variations. And the brain is a very complex place. And so the amount of treatments, uh, around those thousands and thousands of variables that are, are going to keep growing for the rest of my life. I'm not going to see the end of new ideas in this field. So um, just buckle up if you want to jump into this field. <laughs> Good luck. Continuous performance testing. This is a pretty standard common way to assess our patients. Um, it's basically a device. There's a number of different ones like the IVA and the Quick and the Tova and the Connor 3 CPT that essentially give you a go or a no-go stimulus. It's like saying with like the IVA, whenever you see a one, click the button. If you see a two, don't do anything. If you ever hear a one over the speakers, click the button. If you ever hear a two over the speakers, don't do anything. So you have audio and visual go, audio and visual no go, and then a combination of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, pa of, of stimulus of go or no go in a pattern, a specific kind of pattern. It's usually, I think, five, there's, I think there's five, five patterns it repeats itself a number of different times, like fast, slow. No, I don't know. My wife could explain it to you. She studied that more than me. But, but it's, uh, it'll essentially try to get used to a pattern, then we'll slow the pattern or speed the pattern up, or it'll get used to a pattern, then change the pattern and see if you have anticipatory errors. Um, and it's measuring not just your successes or failures, but, but also um, millisecond changes of when you clicked versus when you didn't click. And, and that gives you huge amounts of data, pages and pages and pages of just numbers of data. And uh, when, you, when you quantify that data into different kinds of charts and patterns and you compare them to thousands of other people with that age and gender, um, patterns emerge with ADHD. So it can be used diagnostically, like the IVA 2, for example, I believe fully meets criteria for the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. It'll do, it'll check all the criteria and it will be accurate, uh, I think, was it 96 or 97% with only a 10% false positive 
relative to psychologists that had six months to make the same conclusion with, with patients. So that's a huge, hugely successful and accurate test. It's unbelievably how accurate it is. It also has what we call great retest testability, which essentially means that um, if I keep taking the test over and over and over again, I get the same results throughout my lifetime even. Uh, if I keep comparing myself to my relative norm, age and gender, and the scores are very, very reliable, they don't change much. Um, uh, the cool thing about neurofeedback is neurofeedback changes these scores a lot, which is very exciting for research purposes um, and, and, and you know, good arguments for efficacy and things like that. Just good stuff, good stuff. So there's a bunch of different types of tests like this. Um, and I'm sure there's more and more emerging. Um, there's small versions of CBTs. In neurofeedback, we prefer the big, long ones that are like 15-minute long CPTs. They're very expensive. Um, but uh, the short ones just don't have the same, you know, uh, not, they don't have the same results uh, in research. You know, there's tens of millions of dollars poured into these studies for research purposes. And, and we, we, want, we want to use the ones that have the most efficacy for, for what we're trying to measure. All right, how do I get into neurofeedback? All right, so here's a couple different types of systems out there. The NeuroAmp 2 um, is you're something you're going to find uh, at the Offmers. I recommend starting at eeginfo.com. That'll be covered later. It's kind of medium cost to high cost. Um, it's in for low, you know, it's, it's, I would say it's these days I probably think of it more on the lower cost end to be blunt. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm thinking only about the spectrum, I should be referring to you. I'm going to say it's on the lower cost end, and I'm not a bad place to start partially because you can get online training or you can go to their clinic and you can get trained pretty, pretty intensively, which doing the online training, you'll lose a lot of practical experience or praxis uh, because you won't be there doing it. Um, which, I think like you'll get an hour of lecture and then you'll get an hour of treatment and then an hour of lecture and then you get an hour of treatment and you're literally hooking the person up next to you and then they're going to hook you up. And so you're going to leave feeling really competent with the hands-on training. Um, if there's no one to mentor you, uh, there isn't something else I could recommend you to ethically. Um, Brain Master, uh, it can be really low cost, but it can also be very high. Um, I've got a system that's in the very, very high range for, for Brain Master. Can do a ton. Uh, it can do probably 30 treatments that I'm never going to learn. Um, it can do lens. It can do less Loretta. It can do infralow. It can do infraslow. Blah blah blah. It can do a lot of stuff. Basically, it can do everything. Um, there's other things out there that are like closed systems that do not let you optimize. They do not let you choose protocols. Um, it's out of your hands, and all you learn as the therapist is how to apply the sensor. And, and push start. I don't recommend those systems for so many reasons, which I'm not gonna waste your time bothering you, but, but two of those that I'll outline here are NeuroOptimal and Brain Paint. Brain Paint does have some, say, changes to the protocol, um, but you don't choose them. Brain Paint does based on how your patient answered their questionnaire, which there's some problems there. Um, neither one of them use any form of assessment outside of, well, not, NeuroOptimal doesn't have any assessment at all. Uh, and BrainPaint uh, only has an online questionnaire that you answer for, for assessment. Um, and you can't change anything as the clinician. I don't recommend those two systems. If you had to compromise, I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm definitely less nervous about BrainPaint than I am NeuroOptimal. NeuroOptimal is sold to non-clinical individuals, so they'll sell it to anybody whatsoever. Valdi and Brown, the guy who owns that company and I, we regularly get on arguments <laughs> over these four in our forums and things like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't believe that there should be systems that uh, are non-clinical um, outside of maybe the sensory motor rhythm treatment. Um, I don't believe that there should be systems that can't be optimized. Um, and, uh, and there have been a number of cases in my local area where uh, people have been harmed by some of these systems and have fled to my clinic and I figured out exactly how to fix the specific ab reactions or, or the specific uh, negative effects, say like agoraphobic patients, 
stop sleeping when they do neurooptimal. I've seen a couple of them. That's why I'm making that statement. Based on my experience, I've seen a couple of them stop sleeping and run to my clinic and we figured out exactly which treatment gets them sleeping again, which is nice that we at least know what to do now. Um, Narbis is a, a system that um, is probably the first clinical take-home system um, that has a one-channel uh, movable electrode. So you can actually train one part of the brain and you can change that part of the brain based on what they need. Um, and it's open. So you have to know what to do with it. You have to, same with, with Brain Master, you need a mentor. Okay. You cannot use the system without a mentor. Um, there isn't online training that's going to cover it at all. It's not, not enough. I promise you, you're not going to feel equipped enough to do anything with it. Yeah. If you do any online training, you got to have someone train you how to do it. Someone teach you their techniques. Uh, but the Tech Neuro by MindLift is pretty cool idea. It's a pretty cool idea. Uh, the Narbus, sorry, I, I skipped it. The Narbus is that sensory motor rhythm training that you can do at home. It's non-clinical. It's the only one that I am on the fence about saying, yeah, it's probably okay, just because it's very limited and, and it does something that's pretty safe. Uh, but the Tech Neuro is similar, except you can treat any frequency and you can treat anywhere on the head. So a lot of cool options with that. Um, I've looked into it. There's a lot of debate. I do think it works. Um, I did some beta testing for it before it was commercially available. And, uh, I took a handful of patients, like six patients. We did the CPT or that continuous performance testing. We had them do some theta beta ratio training. Uh, we had them come back. We had them redo the CPT scores. Their scores had significant improvement as I would expect with theta beta ratio training. Uh, so I was convinced, um, patients were reporting great symptom improvement as well, uh, that it, it does the job. I think it does the job. Maybe you, you can you can always find flaws with systems, but, um, but the question is like, you know, was it better than what they were doing in the 60s? You know, <laughs> like, sure, probably. You, you can complain all day about flaws, but but it, if it worked in the 60s and 70s and, and this is not worse than that, then we're probably going to be okay. <laughs> uh, more concerned about ethically, you know, if you're going to get harmed. Um, if you know what you're doing, no. But, but that's one you got to have a mentor for, just like the Brain Master unbelievable potential with the right kind of brain master system that you got to know what you're doing and that's a lot of training a lot of mentoring all right so softwares we've talked about the the different cbts brain mapping systems you know requiring specialized training that's for assessment not treatment unless you're doing s loretta training and supervision this is probably what we really care about this probably should be moved up you know, maybe I already did my, my newer editions, but, but training and supervision and certification seems like something you'd want to know ahead of time. Uh, the Othmer method certification or Othmer method training can be done at eeginfo.com. Um, and uh, they can offer online consultation or supervision. They can offer online training or physical training. Don't skimp, go to California or where it's lo lo locally offered. Do the training there. You will regret doing it online. It's nice that it's online, but it's just not the same as getting the hands-on and you need the hands-on training. You just do. It's the same stuff online, but you know, you're not going to have the individual coaching that you really need uh, to figure out how to get the sensors in the exact right place for someone to be looking over your shoulder and saying, no, that's not correct or good job. All right. So uh, that author method certification is unbelievably intense. Uh, my wife started it, and I'm pretty sure it was harder than her master's degree. Um, <clears throat> there's, <laughs> there's another one. Uh, uh, this is the one I have, the board certification neurofeedback right there. Uh, let's see, right at the bottom right there. Um, that one now, I believe, requires you have to have a healthcare license to have it, or you're, you, can, you can do the certification. You're just going to be a technician so long as you're working under somebody else, but it's completely voided. The moment you're not employed by somebody with a healthcare license um so they like physically send you another certification every time you get a different job with 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 your employer's name on it as well so you have to have a healthcare license above you in order for uh you to be a technician if you have a healthcare license you can get board certified in neurofeedback i the ba or bs in healthcare i think that might be a master's degree required now so that might need to be updated uh or higher um, this one it can be low cost or high cost, depending on, um, say whether you can find a mentor who's volunteering or whether you're having to pay for it. If you're out of the area and you're paying somebody, hopefully a good, you know, mentor, um, you might be paying quite a bit of money for every one of those hours that you're doing, um, 
you know, you're training on. And uh, most mentors are going to require, as is recommended by the BCIA.org and by, for your BCN, they usually recommend that you participate in a one-year internship at a neurofeedback clinic. They don't require it for certification, but they recommend it. And uh, there's good reason for that. If you follow the minimum uh, qualifications of the certification, uh, you're gonna have problems. Um, you also have to have been trained uh, and you have to demonstrate that you can, um, you know, uh, affect your own nervous system through neurofeedback. So, so you also have to be responsive yourself to it. Um, so there's a lot of dimensions to those certifications. <clears throat> that certification, by the way, does not necessarily prepare you for any particular type of neurofeedback unless obviously the internship requirement does that for you. And that's obviously what you want. <clears throat> Again, there are manufacturer regulated equipment like brain paint where they'll have you do a couple hours online just how to hook people up and then um, they're lease only. So you have no mechanism for outgrowing the system and you also have no control. Um, not a huge fan of those kinds of things, um, personally. Uh, I've, I've, I've trained under brain paint before, I, uh, and I, I, I know people who do good work under brain paint, but it's not, uh, it's not optimal. You know, we, I think you guys can do better, and, uh, and we, should, we should probably try to strive to have the best quality uh, equipment, not just quantity <clears throat> of practitioners. Uh, another place to get good information and uh, training is the International Society of Neurofeedback Research. They won't train you how to use a specific type of equipment, just like the BCIA or the BCN, but you will um, be put in the way of in just amazing, amazing people. Um, like I think it was the Neuralink guys from Elon Musk's um, uh, um, with the, 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 the with the, the announcement, whatever they had uh, two weeks ago, whatever, I met those two researchers that did that presentation. I actually met them at the ISNR, I think it was six years ago or something like that. And um, so I was really, really excited to see them present on it again. Great stuff, absolutely great stuff. Um, but yeah, mentoring and supervision, if you haven't noticed, it all kind of boils down to that. Find a great mentor, find a great supervisor, uh, don't cut corners. Um, it's going to cost either a ton or you'll find someone to volunteer. But um, but uh, it's, it's oftentimes about the level of training that you can get. <clears throat> and uh, maybe someday we'll offer a school here in the Portland, Vancouver area. Uh, I'm not opposed to, to starting a school. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. All right, so disclaimer, this course does not prepare you to practice. Uh, it's just trying to help you get on your way. Again, my primary recommendation for starting is eeginfo.com uh, with a lot of those auxiliary resources. Um, you can always go on to websites uh, like brainmaster.com, the brainmaster website, and there's probably outlets to find online mentors for more complicated systems. Um, you know, uh, and you can always do that too. I mean, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing that right now as well. Like I've, I've got a new mentor and I've got a new system and we're starting over. <laughs> uh, the best trained practitioners are more effective. Um, so get well-trained. Literally, meaning like get good training, but also get trained, you know, become a patient first too. You know, I was a patient before I was a clinician and that's actually kind of required for certification. So it's not a bad place to start, you know, see how, see how you respond to it. That will only feed your passion for it. <clears throat> um, neurofeedback is often considered experimental by a lot of insurance companies and other, uh, I don't know how true that is anymore. This is an old statement. Um, but uh, by a lot of regulatory institutions are sometimes considered it experimental. And not everything we do has efficacy. And not all the best treatments have efficacy also. Like as I said, theta-beta ratio training is like, I don't know, 87% effective according to the Thompson Clinic that has the best practice. But I like my 100% success rate so far with my infralow approach. Um, so it's like, uh, you know, things that look good in research, should it look better in your clinic? In some ways, maybe, you know, in a lot of ways, I would hope so, yeah. I think, I think it's, it's very possible that you can do better than what you observe in research um, because you're optimizing it to the client. You're not working in a sterile environment. You can increase uh, or add modalities or coaching or counseling. Uh, there's a number of things you should be able to do to help them uh, uh, improve more holistically rather than just trying to measure the effect of a single variable. 
I mean, we do want our clients to be convinced that it's, you know, working and that it's not just the talk therapy or it's not just the other modalities or it's not just all the coaching. Um, but, but again, like oftentimes I think at least in my clinical caseload, um, they're happy enough to see the improvements in the CPT scores uh, and they just want to get better. They just want to get better. That's what they want. So, yeah, um, but you can look up and, and, you know, I think Blue Cross Blue Shield still considers neurofeedback experimental, so they don't want to cover it, um, which there's a lot of politics in there because the Healthcare Act actually does require that neurofeedback be reimbursed, uh, but we don't have our own codes. And so, you know, there's all kinds of loopholes to get out of it from what I understand. That's really complicated. I might not fully understand that that area. I don't actually work with an insurance, so I don't really uh, follow up on that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't track it as, as much as other people do. You'd have to talk to some of my, my associates. <clears throat> so there's a little bit about my information. Hopefully you guys know a little bit about me. This is wildly out of date anyway, so we're going to go ahead and skip it. <clears throat> and here's your references. Things you can look up in your own time uh, that might be useful to you. Uh, if you want to get more information uh, or read further, I'd like to think that these references are really, really helpful for you. I really do. I spent a lot of time into getting them on here. So, <laughs> all right. So thanks for listening to me. I'll probably record another one of these in a little bit, um, maybe on a different topic, but uh, there's one of your lectures for you guys. I hope you are doing well.